It's One Nation Restorations, and we're restoring another American-made tool with American-made tools. Today, we're giving this 100-year-old coping saw some visual upgrades to help it fit in a little better with the rest of the tools in the workshop. It has some light rust and pitting around the frame, but the bulk of the rust is on the arms and on the handle. The handle is also getting some light sanding to take out the imperfections and scratches and also a new coat of stain. I picked up this EC Atkins & Co piece for about $7 at an antique shop in Tennessee, which is a pretty standard price to pay for a coping saw like this. The design of these things has not changed much over the 100 years since this thing was forged outside of the American-made coping saw by new concepts that'll set you back a couple hundred bucks. We'll start these upgrades by loosening the handle the same way you would if you were replacing the blade. Make sure to brace the arm when removing the handle like you see here because the thin blade is under an immense amount of tension and pressure along the length of the body. Perpendicular pressure can cause the blade to shatter. Turning the handle without holding the arm will twist the blade and lead to this. Make sure you're wearing eye protection here just in case because those pieces will shoot off in an unpredictable direction. This arm was designed to go into the handle almost a full two inches to give the saw stability when you're cutting. Check the handle for play and look over the screw for any damage to the threads. If you see any, use a thread cleaner or restore depending on your condition of the screw. When this saw was forged, the second arm was inserted into the end clip and then it was attached to the frame. Two rivets hold it into place, so if you want to remove the arm, just take out these rivets. This is relatively easy to do. Just use a grinder, file, or a chisel from a punch set to remove the head and then use a punch to push out the pin. Here at One Nation Restorations, we try to preserve as much of the original piece as we can, including the 100-year-old rivets. If that doesn't matter to you, I recommend using an American-made hand rivet squeezer and dimple like you see here. This metal is soft, so a pneumatic rivet gun might leave some marks on your frame. This is relatively light work compared to most of the projects we have at the shop, but that doesn't make the detail work here any less important. For coping saws with more rust, drop them into a vapor rust solution and you're caught up. If you have deeper pitting, I still wouldn't take that out because you're going to leave a low spot in your work. For handles that are stripped out or wood that's cracked, you may need to buy a new one or create your own using a lathe. Use your best judgment for your projects and do what feels right. To see more on what to do with deep pitting or how to polish, check the description for links to videos that showcase these techniques. The handle of this saw received a two-stage process. I started with 150 grit to do the bulk of the knockdown work and to remove the scratches. Remember to sand in the direction of the grain, otherwise your sandpaper will leave directional marks that stick out after you stain it. I finished the sanding with a 220 grit. This gives the wood a smooth, soft feel and it looks great after you stain it. Before you apply that stain though, I took care of the rust on the handle. This is gonna go against the grain, which is why I taped off the bottom of the handle. I used the same two grits for this because I'm not going for a polished look on the frame and I want this handle to match. The color of the stain that I used for this was the same red chestnut from the Stanley hand plane video. I fell in love with how that handle turned out, so I'm looking to replicate that here. It's very similar to the original color that was on this, but it's gonna have a subtle red hue to it. While that's drying, I started work on the arm. This is a great time to do a quality check on the threads and get them back to new. Start with the pitch gauge to take out the guessing work for which size to use. These threads are in great shape, so the focus was on the sanding for this project. The rounded knob and the dome top are susceptible to squaring, but you can easily avoid this by rotating the part as you sand to prevent flattening it in one spot. To get into the tight corners, I recommend folding the paper to create a straight edge. You'll need to do this repeatedly though because it's only gonna last four to five strokes before the paper edge is gone. I finished with the buffing wheel after the 220 grit just to take out the fine scratches. I only used the firm pad here because we were not going for that mirrored look. The frame was given a similar treatment to that arm, but the longest part of this process was getting around those rivet heads. This would have been much easier to sand had we taken the time to remove those end clips and the rivets, but unless they're worn out or damaged, I try not to do that. For the sanding, speed was the name of the game. You don't want to make any deep grooves here, and all you're trying to do is take off the surface rust. I also don't want to take away any of the metal around the company stamping. I want somebody to be able to appreciate the history of the company that made it after it gets passed on. The more restorations I do, the more I appreciate the American tool makers that have vanished from existence. E.C. Atkins & Co. began making saws back in the mid-1800s and had over 100 patents from 1850 to 1950. They focused on circular and cross-cut saws early on but expanded their reach to hundreds of products by the 1900s, including the introduction of their coping saw line. The number 50 coping saw made its debut into their catalog for the first time in 1919 as far as I can tell. Their reach was so strong, they were even the second largest manufacturer of saws in the world at one point. And it wasn't until the third generation of their family-owned business before they were bought out and eventually absorbed. 
The U.S. Postal Service bought this empty warehouse in Indianapolis so they could knock it down and build their own. If you enjoyed this moment in history, click the subscribe button to help our channel grow. It's easy to give the edges of a coping saw a clean look with some file work. You want a smooth, balanced stroke to prevent creating any low spots anywhere along the edge. Once you're happy with the look, it's onto the buffing wheel. Now, this American-made buffing wheel is from Dyco, and you can find them in the link in the description below. They come with a half-inch adapter flange, but you can drill those out and create your own size for a larger arbor washer. You'll also find the Dyco's line of compounds down in the description, and I used an E5 here to remove the scratches from the sandpaper. If you want a mirrored look, move to the SCR or the GRN on a softer wheel. Apply the compound often and keep moving the piece to avoid heat buildup. This piece didn't come from E.C. Atkins & Co.'s factory with a polished look, so I fought back the urge to polish this thing off. Getting ready for final assembly, remove the tape after the stain is dried to the touch. I let it sit for 24 hours in front of a fan before handling it. I also used a terry cloth and some shop rags to remove the grease after touching it with my gloves during the polishing stage. I do this in every video, polish to perfection, and then immediately get it dirty with my gloves. The before pictures look decent at first glance at the beginning of this video, but it doesn't stack up to the newly restored look. The handle is almost dead on and all the exposed metal pieces look factory clean. When putting the handle back on, ease the screw into the socket to prevent any cross threading. Carefully bring the screw all the way back onto the handle just to make sure there isn't any binding along the way. Back it out to allow for the installation of the blade. Now I used an American made Olsen blade here, which provides a smooth, accurate cut. I typically use their medium blade, but they have blades from extra fine to coarse depending on the job. You'll be able to cut wood, plastic, or metal with their blade selection. Remember, hold the arm while you tighten the handle. The extreme tension along the blade makes them vulnerable to breaking if you let the blade twist under tension. I often get asked about how much to tighten a coping saw blade. These blades are tempered or made of carbon steel, so they should not break due to tightening. So the answer to this question is to tighten them all the way. Turn the handle until it stops. The two reasons that they should break are because the arm turned while you were tightening it or because you were turning in the middle of the wood when you were not making the cutting action. This tool takes a fair amount of practice to get used to that feel when you cut and curve at the same time. Having just said that, I'm always cautious installing these, keeping my face away from it and wearing safety glasses just in case. After a final look at how the piece turned out, it's time to put it to use. The coping saw is great for making curves in your cuts. The finer the blade, the tighter the turn that you can make. The last question you have to think about is if you want a push or a pull cut. The push cut cuts the wood as you push the blade forward and the pull cut does the opposite. It cuts the wood when you pull the blade towards you. Comment below with your personal preference. This restoration took five hours to complete, not counting the drying time for the handle. The longest part of this restoration was sanding the clips and the rivets at the end of the frame. My favorite part of this restoration was setting the handle back to its original look and going down that history rabbit hole. We restored another American-made tool with American-made tools. See you next time.